Hi everyone. Okay, so last month in the blog I was talking about the importance of adhering to a regular structured focus practice regime as the best way to make progress on the guitar. And really that is definitely the most effective way of, of doing things regardless of what kind of activity you're involved in. But of course the reality of the situation is that we can't always do that. Schedules are erratic, it can be hard to find free time, so committing to 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, finding that time within your day can be a really, really tough deal for a lot of people. So a lot of people get despondent about the fact that they've missed a session, that they can't make up the time, and they, just, they start to feel dispirited, demoralised, and they feel like giving in. Which is a great shame, and it doesn't have to be like that. You actually can make an awful lot of progress with very, very short bursts of focus practising. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of kind of Think of them as micro practice sessions. And uh, I've been doing a little thinking on this and um, come up with one or two ideas to get you started. So first off, what I'll say from the outset for whatever level of ability you are, don't do the thing where you keep the guitar locked away in the case under the bed or whatever, where you've got to go through a whole rigmarole to get it set up, get plugged in, get tuned up, everything like that. All that stuff does is create lots of artificial barriers between you and the guitar. It creates reasons not to practice, reasons not to do things, and you really don't need that. Just have the guitar out, keep it on a stand in the room that you spend most time in, and um, so that you can just simply you can just pick up. And just noodle. You know, playing the guitar should be a natural activity, it's fun after all, that's why we do it. So have the guitar there, have it ready just to be picked up and, and slung around the neck, but when you do it, Again, you can just pick up a noodle, you can just kind of spend time strumming an unfocused way, but you're not really going to be getting a great many results. You're putting in time, you're putting in maybe effort, but you're not really going to achieve results unless you actually try new things, you try and uh, develop your capacity on the instrument. Okay, so firstly then, beginners, this is for you guys. Now, as anyone who studied with me or read um, Zero Point Guitar or Zero Point Bass will know, I stress rhythm above all else, really, for learning an instrument. Without a good sense of rhythm, nothing you play is ever going to sound fantastic. It's never really going to sound musical. Rhythm is what pulls music together and makes it music, not just noise. So, there's always music around. So, as you come in from work, put the telly on. There's going to be there's going to be music on in the background, whether it's a theme tune whether it's incidental music, whether it's an advert, tap your foot to it. It's a natural thing. So, tapping the foot, your body is responding to music that it hears. Next thing, have your pick hand, the hand that channels rhythm, move in sync. So, I'm not using any fancy equipment here, I haven't had to turn a drum machine on or plug in an amplifier or anything like that. It's just me and a guitar and I'm tapping my foot. And we just play muted strings, find your downbeat, Play a nice simple crotchet rhythm, your whole body's in sync. Then add the quaver upbeats. And I'm still just playing muted strings here, there's nothing tricky going on here, we're just focusing purely on the rhythm aspects of playing. And now I'm trying out beats. And now let's mix them up. creating little grooves like that and it can be you know we're spending 10-15 seconds there but you're homing in on a facet of playing that does challenge an awful lot of people okay moving on then a lot of songs have for beginners have have speed bumps in them they're not the same level of difficulty all the way through and if you're very limited on time it makes sense to simply practice those speed bumps to kind of roll them flat perfect example I use the song twist and shout by the Beatles an awful lot with my beginner students the song. There we go, in a simple form. Now the tricky part with that, on the end of beat, sorry, of the end of bar one, we've got a G on the downbeat of beat four, followed by an A on the offbeat. So you've got to do two things there, you've got to change very quickly, and you've got to change your head of where you would naturally expect to. That's what gives the rhythm its, its push, its life. So, makes sense then, rather than strumming the whole thing through over and over again, make the same mistakes and getting dispirited, getting frustrated, let's focus just on the tricky bit. So all I'm doing there is arpeggiating the G to the A change, training my fingers to get used to the idea that I'm playing the G on the downbeat. 
and you can see I'm rocking backwards and forwards as well. Now that is, believe it or not, that is deliberate. I'm trying to physically reference where the down and the up part of the beat is. Just to get a feel for how to, that change on the off beat should feel. Now, that's a very, very simple little exercise. You set your timer for, let's say, a minute. How many times do you think you can perform that? That change takes, what, two seconds, three seconds? So you're going to play that between 20 and 30 times in the space of one minute. You can't really fail to improve on that speed bump in that amount of time. Having done that, put the chord change back into the context of the song. And you're almost guaranteed to make progress. So just a couple of those sessions, and you can find yourself making progress all the way through. And there's lots of other things that we can try as well. Coordination, for example. Now, again, I, I always do warm-ups with my students. And uh, for beginners, you know, you're probably familiar with that chromatic spider exercise. And if you're not, you certainly should be. And it's all very well and good. And certainly, as the weather turns colder, warming up does genuinely become a consideration. But the problem with this exercise is it only exercises the fingers in a very linear order, so we, we can try and make that a bit more progressively difficult. Mixing up the finger combinations and focusing also on the weaker fingers. Now your weakest finger is the little finger, because we simply don't use it. It just sits there most of the day. And the coordination generally between third finger and fourth finger is pretty weak. So adapting the spider exercise to focus purely on those two fingers is a worthwhile thing. You can also try it as I'm doing here with the second and fourth fingers. So again, by focusing in purely on on small detail aspects of your playing for you know blocks of time of no more than a minute or two, you can really start to make progress just by focusing in on the weak spots. For you more advanced guys, we can also we can we can take the same ideas and develop them. And um, going back to rhythm, again tap your foot, respond to the music that you hear around you, or hell, it's even the beat that you hear in your head. So your foot is responding to that rhythm, and then we start with the crotchets, quavers, and we can go into semi quavers as well. Sixteenth notes if you're watching across the Atlantic. And we can start to create a little bit of syncopation here as well. And you know you can find some very musical ideas within these within just these rhythms. And uh, it sharpens that skill, it hones that skill. Even if you're only doing it for a couple of minutes, you'd be surprised what you can do just by focusing in on that one area. Let's take another example as well. We often, when we play the guitar, we pick up and we play the same licks. We come reliant on the same uh, vocabulary of licks time and time again. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Everybody has their styles. But it's, it's easy to get trapped in that. It's easy to feel like you're trapped in, in, in that kind of playing. So let's, we, we, can, we can develop these ideas very simply. Let's take a, a simple blues lick that we all use time and again. It's an E minor pentatonic there. Okay, well that's all very well and good, but you hear it time and time again, it does become a little bit predictable. So, what can we do to develop that? Well, you could go off and learn a whole bunch of scales like the harmonic minor and uh, melodic minor and all the, the most like the Phrygian dominant, but let's be honest, you're not really going to use them, are you? So it's going to be wasted effort. Let's try, just taking a really simple idea then, we take this blues lick and we're going to turn it backwards. Forwards. Backwards. So what I'm doing there, I've got my pre-bends, and the whole texture of it's completely different, it's really quirky, really kind of ear-catching sound now, and because it's minor pentatonic, we already know how to use the minor pentatonic, it just, we're just doing it in a slightly different way. Okay, so having discovered this new lick, let's put it into context, we don't just play licks on their own. So. A great exercise I use with a lot of my students, this is the two bar on, two bar off exercise. It's so simple, but it, my goodness, it's so effective. So what I'm going to do here then is I'm going to set up a groove on an E power chord, and I'm just going to swap between it and my new blues lick without breaking pace. <coughs> Excuse me. And by 
by putting it in context, you're forced to resolve your way out of the phrase and keep the groove. So you're always learning to think ahead and being able to fit the lick into the right amount of space. You're learning its rhythmic uh, meaning, if you like. You're not just learning the word, you're learning how to use it, you're learning what it means. You're also learning how to place that lick musically. Okay, so having got it in the key of E, let's move it around. Obviously we can use octaves as a tool. Playing it with, with open strings is a completely different idea from playing it up at the 12th fret. We can also use the cycle of fourths as a great little practice tool. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the interval of the fourth, it's the interval of five semitones. So that's E up to A, A up to D, D up to G, and so on around the chromatic scale. Now, let me give you an example then of, uh, of, of a complete practice session using, micro practice session using these ideas. So, taking the blues lick, starting off in E. to A, up an octave, D, Total time taken, no more than a couple of minutes. Equipment required, none. Your guitar and your foot, and that's it. So hopefully then, this has given you a couple of ideas as to how you can really make progress, even when your day is fragmented and your schedule's all broken up and just finding five minutes to practice or to do anything is, um, is, is an issue. So for all you busy guys out there, I hope this has inspired you a little bit, and uh, take care, we'll see you soon.